<laughs> Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are. Just as you are to worship. 
justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all fame and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside Amen. I want to invite you to be seated. It's fun kind that gives us a bit of a challenge in, in how we live out our faith. I think so often as humans, we, we try to fix the outside. It's like we try to work from the outside in. If I can just discipline myself and get all the stuff on the outside, get my actions, my attitudes right, everything will be fine. But when we're trying to fix the outside, so often we're trying to do it from our broken perspective, from, from our human thinking. And really, to be a changed person, it means that we've got to transform at the core of who we are. I think in Romans 12, where it says we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, that that, that needs to happen, not just a singular thing, but it happens on, on a daily, sometimes on many moments in a day basis, because the world never quits asserting its mindset on how we ought to handle situations. And then for us to, you know, how do we respond? How do we respond with that Christ-like attitude? And our natural tendency, we kind of got into it last week a bit, our tendency of our flesh is to respond in a, in a worldly or in a fleshly way. And it's hard to turn away from that. And so we need a, this transformation that occurs. And God promises that. He promises he will transform us. So I love that song. And it just, I mean, it talks about this image of, uh, of surrender. How do, I, how do I let go of my want to be in control and let God begin to change me? And even call me out on some of the areas that I've rationalized and reasoned are, are fine. They're okay. I'm, I'm functioning adequately in them. And, uh, but to allow God to really examine me and, and expose the areas of my life and the attitudes of my life that aren't in tune with his will. So, you know, I'm going to surrender. And God can teach us every day. So, let's come before our Lord in prayer this day. Gracious Lord and God, we thank you. Lord, that you, you don't... You don't leave us abandoned to try and figure out how to please you, how to honor you, how to glorify and worship you, how to live lives that, that witness that you have changed us. Lord, you don't ask us to figure that out on our own, but rather you promise over and over and over again in your word that you desire to change us. Lord Jesus, when, when you left this world, you sent your Holy Spirit not just to, to live near us or to be in the world, but you said that the Father would send the Spirit to dwell in us, to teach us, to remind us, to teach us all things and remind us of everything that you proclaimed while you were on the earth. So Lord, we just pray for hearts of learning, but for minds that crave what you offer. For Lord, we want to find life in you and you alone. Amen. So I want to share with you a few quotes that, you know, I just decided, okay, let's talk about this concept of change. Because last week we started off on a journey in which we talked about the element of being led by the Spirit of God or being led by the Spirit of the flesh. And we're all being led by one Spirit or the other. And maybe we're being led a little bit by both. We want to say by the Spirit of God, but maybe there's some areas of our life that, that we haven't surrendered. And so that, that spirit of the flesh or, or that spirit of weakness in our flesh is still susceptible to what's going on in the world. But the element is we, we hear, this, hear this attitude to be led by the Spirit of God, to choose to say no to our flesh and to choose to say yes to the things of God involves change. And there's some attitudes about change out there, and I've stumbled across them here and there, but I thought I'd grab a few that, that people have said, and it says, uh, people don't change. They just get better at hiding who they really are. Another one said, people don't change, they just have momentary steps outside of their character. Another said, people don't change, only their costumes do. People don't change, they only find more effective ways to deceive who they really are before you, to lie to you. 
People don't change their behavior unless it makes a difference for them to do so. No, I want to grab onto that last one, don't you? I mean, it's like we, to, to think about what is it to change our behavior. I mean, when we get confronted by, by the Holy Scriptures, and when we get confronted by the Holy Spirit, and we see that the life that we're living is inconsistent with what God would have us live, there, there ought to be a motivation or a hunger inside to change. And so we hear that image of living by the Spirit of the flesh versus living by the, by the Spirit and by the guidance of the Spirit of God, and, and there ought to be a hunger in us to want to live by the leading of the Spirit of God. Amen? I mean, that, that, that makes sense. So if we know that, there ought to be a want to change, and if we have a want to change by what this last quote said, there, there ought to be an ability to change our behavior. Well, I don't know what, you, what it's like in your life, but I suspect that yours is probably a little bit like mine. As much as we want to change our behavior, we find ourselves ebbing back into those old ways. It's like, what, what is it that we know what's good, we know what's right, we know what's true, we know the, desire, the, the direction we want to go, the direction that God would have us go, the direction we were intended for, and, and yet this, this old way, the, these old attachments are things that are constantly clawing at us, trying to draw us back into those mindsets, into those ways of acting. So I want to take us into Ephesians 4. This is the Apostle Paul. We dealt with him a little bit last week as he wrote to, to the church in Rome. Now he's writing to the church in Ephesus. It says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so Paul articulates it right there. He says, you need to take that old self, that old way of living, that, that old, those old attitudes, you need to cast them off, you need to be done with them, and you put it on the new self. And that sounds so easy, only it isn't, is it? There's something about that old self that, that, that again, I mean, it, it's clawing at us, but there's also something inside of us that, that craves it. Why would we crave that which we know is harmful to us? It's like I remember sitting there and listening many times as I was growing up, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Now, we wouldn't want to call God the devil, but right? basically we want to sit there and say, better the thing that you know that you're living in and you know how to manage it than the unknown. That's how we would put it as Christians, okay? Better to sit there and have something where I know how to live, I know how to interact with people, I know if they do this to me, I can react like this get back at them, get even, do whatever, and they won't mess with me anymore. And I know that works. But now I step into this new thing, this unknown, this place where God says, I want you to step in, I want you to learn from me, I want you to walk in my way, I want you to do things like forgiving others when they wrong you. It's like, now wait a second. I mean, getting even is half the fun of life, right? Or getting even in such a way that they're never going to cross that line again. And God's saying, forgive, they're just going to treat me like a doormat. I need to get back over here. When we sit there and we think about the, the attitudes of our minds, the things that the thought life that we have, that when somebody wrongs us, when somebody insults us, when somebody persecutes us, when somebody, the things that go through our mind about how we'd like to respond about how we might like to make them look, about the image that we'd like to draw, about the words we'd like to say. Even if we don't say them, those things go through our mind. They poison our heart. They poison our life. And God's over here saying, you need to surrender all that to me and you need to learn, learn to walk in a way in which the thought of your mind is kindness, the thought of your mind is forgiveness. The thought, and it's like, wait a second, God. Why, why am I going to take this new, stat, a new path I look at the world, I see how it operates, I lived in it, I know how people are going to treat me if I do that. But we don't, do we? God calls us to, to live this exemplary life, even in the face of persecution and insults and whatever else is thrown at us, and let that exemplary life be a witness to all those around us. And somehow God is going to use that to bless to bless us and to bless others. And I, and I get to wrestling with my, that in my life, and it's like, but, but it's so easy to want. I mean, why would anybody want to put on this old life? The answer is, I know how to live in it. But in this new life, it's, it's so many unfamiliar elements, so many things in which I'm waiting on the good that God desires to bring. I'm waiting for God to bring transformation. And if you're waiting like the average human, okay, fine, I did good, now let's go. 
I, I want to see them. I want to see that whole thing that God talks about, how my acting in kindness when they act in evil is going to heap uh, you know, hot coals on their head. I mean, tell me we don't cop an attitude where we're like, all right, let's see it happen. I mean, we, we get into this new self and we still have our old mindset attached to us. When that old self does grab hold, we deal with some stuff. If we, if we commit to stepping into the new and, and the old claws back and pulls us back in, I think as Christians so often when that occurs, when we're striving with everything in us to live in this new life in Christ, when we fail, we feel weak, we feel defeated, we feel embarrassed, we may wonder what's wrong with us. We may wonder why, you know, why God isn't helping us, why God isn't strengthening us, what we've gotten wrong, how come I'm not a good enough Christian, maybe God's given up on me, maybe I've committed the sin, maybe I spent too long in that old self. We have all sorts of things that roll through our minds that when, when, it's, when it's not working, when we're striving over here, and yet we keep on falling back into this old life because it's familiar, because it's what we know, because the actions are there. And we want to change it, we want to see it transformed, and we, we bring it to prayer and we ask God for the miracle. Do you, do you pray like little miracle prayers? Ones where you ask God to just do something in you? I mean, like, I don't want to have to commit any effort. Do you ever pray those kind of prayers? The week where, where I kind of messed up with... You know, being a dad, I mean, I was like, just kind of dropped the ball, and, and, and then I just pray, God, make me a better father. I mean, not that I do anything about it, right? I just pray for it, make the magic happen. God, make, give, give me greater hunger for your word, so I want to be in your word. I want to be there every single day. You're like, you're a preacher, you shouldn't have this problem. I tell you, I do. Because you know what I do when I read the word? I get in it, and I start reading it, and I'm like, start reading it for me, and I get about a verse and a half in, I'm like, yeah, that would make a good sermon. And I start totally thinking of it from that perspective. I stop reading the word for me, and I start reading the word for, for what I do. And yet God's word is, is spoken out to each of us to, to serve as a mirror for us, to challenge us, to, to feed us, and to help us grow, and to... And I'm just, God, just give me a hunger. God, give me a, a greater desire for prayer. This new self that God wants to plant in us, it's not just about avoiding worldly attitudes in terms of how we treat other people. It's, it's walking away from worldly attitudes that are self-serving and walking into a place where our feeding is not of worldly things, where our nourishment is not of worldly things, but our nourishment comes from God and God alone. So the hungers that we pray for in those prayers aren't wrong. God, teach me how to be a better leader, a better preacher, a better pastor. Father, teach me how to be a better father. But there's got to be a commitment and a hunger to say, Lord, I want to grow. I want to learn from you, and I want to grow. Oh, wait a second. I know you got your spirit in me. I said that. Don't, you know, don't follow the spirit of the flesh. Follow the spirit of God. Let the spirit of God lead you. So I'm good. I want to grow. Just let your spirit do that leading, and I'll listen. It sounds like an awful lot in which we're still not stepping up to the plate and saying, I'm going to invest. I'm going to do some commitment with my life. One of the things that we find out when we do our Christian walk that are so, that's so essential is that we engage the spiritual disciplines. We see that in Jesus' own life, that as he went through, through times when he was going to face great challenge in his life, even though everybody else might have been pressing in to say, Jesus, we need your time, we need your attention, we need your focus, we need your healing. We, what did Jesus do? He took off and he went by himself to to pray, to dwell in the presence of his heavenly Father. To, I mean, he knew what fed his soul and what equipped him and what strengthened him. And he wasn't afraid to go and take hold of it. He had disciplines that were present in his life, whether it be time of prayer or silence or solitude. or, or He practiced these things. He engaged these disciplines in our life. And as we, as we look into the New Testament, we see these kind of disciplines engaged by the apostles. They lift them up about how we spend our time immersing in God's presence in different ways so that he can lead us down at the core of who we are. Probably one of the most impactful ones starts right here in his word. 
there was a study, and if I remember right, is a study that was done over the course of 10 years by the Institute for Biblical Research. Talked about the, the effects of reading this word. And he said, you know what? If you read this word one time a week, it has very little to no effect. You read it two times a week, about the same. Three times a week, and it started to have a little effect, but nothing really significant. But they saw an incredible and dramatic shift for people who read the Bible four times a week or more. There was a transformation that occurred in their life. And I mean, part of me wants to be the math guy and just say, I'm pretty sure there's seven days in a week. And when you, when you cross over that middle threshold, that halfway threshold, and you are spending more time, more days in the Word than you are not in the Word, there is something dramatic that changes. There's something that dramatic that happens in, in our lives. And so they did this and they began to examine the lives of these people and found out what, what happened in their life. What do you mean it had a dramatic effect? Well, as they studied this group, I want to share with you some of the, the statistics. They found that loneliness dropped 30%. 30% of the people I mean, just had a drop in their sense of love. Anger issues dropped 32%. Bitterness in relationships dropped 40%. I wonder how many, how many divorces or how many, how many families that are being torn apart by all of the anxiety, the frustration, the bitterness, the attitudes could have been solved or could have been abated or could have been healed if there was time spent in the Word. Alcoholism my mind, alcoholism dropped 57%. Wonder what would happen with other addictions. Would it be similar? God wants our attention because in his word, he's feeding us and he's filling us. Spearing and feeling spiritually stagnant. The report was it dropped 60%. How many people sit there and they say, I want, a, I want a growing, vital relationship with God in which I trust God and I follow God's lead and I, and I live in this, this new self that, that God has offered me and I learn to, to listen to Him, to follow Him. To, I, I want a vibrant prayer life. I want to... We feel like we're spiritually stuck because we keep on trying to approach God through our same human methods apart from His Word that fills us. We say, but, but, but I, I read my devotional every morning. Some people say that. It's like, well, I read God's Word every morning. I do a devotional. And I want to challenge you with that devotional. Go into it. And maybe you can mentally do that right now. Go into it. Tell me how many verses of Scripture your devotional covers. Because 95% plus of devotionals are built off one verse a day. Like, well, that, that's pretty good, right? I mean, that, like, at least you're getting some Bible. The problem is, is it gives us the verse, and then it tells us a story. And most people get immersed in the story, not in the Scripture. What would happen if we actually spent time in the Scripture and, and let it speak to us? To really dwell in it. And this isn't necessarily a thing. I mean, maybe you want to read through the Bible in a year, and, and, and there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That is a, that's a you know, great aspiration to have in your life. But, but maybe you're in a place where you're struggling with something like bitterness, or you're struggling with addiction, or you're struggling with anger. And to be able to look up that topic, I mean, you can go buy a book that does all this kind of topical stuff for studying the Bible, or you can pop onto the internet, get on your phone, whatever, and look up scriptures about dealing with anger. And you begin, to, you begin to read scriptures that are in that list. And what are they speaking to you? What are they saying to you? How are they challenging you? How are they encouraging you? How are they building you up? And you're going to come across a few where it's just going to sit there, the anger word is going to trip, and you're like, well, that really doesn't relate to my situation. That's okay. Or maybe you just can't see how it relates to your situation right now, but maybe it does. And people are like, you know, but, but, but I came up and there's 27 verses on anger and I read them all today and, and, and then I got up tomorrow and I still have the same issues. Maybe you need to read them again. Sometimes we get so consumed with the idea of, of we have to do new scripture every single day. What if you took a passage that spoke to you or a set of passages that spoke to you 
things that, that were beginning to connect with you, and you said, you know what, this, this is saying something that I need to hear. I'm going to spend every day for the next week, or I'm going to spend every day for the next month, and I am going to read these same passages and dwell in them and pray about them and talk to God about the situation in my life, and maybe even say, God, I want what's in that scripture passage right there. I want that in my life, and I don't know how to get it. God, I can relate to this over here. I can relate to how, you know, how this person got angry with you, and how, God, how did you deal with him? How will you deal with me? How will you help me through this? To, to allow scripture to begin to inform and, 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 and guide our prayer life. think about that image. I feel spiritually stagnant. I start off with scripture and it begins to have an effect on my life and it begins to have an effect on my discipline of spending time with God every day and then it begins to be the thing that, that begins to guide how I pray and what I pray about. It almost sounds like you're become, becoming spiritually unstuck a little bit. Like things are, are starting to happen where you're, you're, you're stepping back into some practices, some attitudes, some approaches that, that are reclaiming some things or maybe claiming some things for the first time in your relationship with God. We want the magic, the magic pill so often. If I just go to worship and listen really intently to the sermon, maybe God will change me. If I just pray really hard about this one thing, maybe God will change it in my life. But what we see throughout the Bible over and over and over again are people who spent time with the Lord their God. Who every time God did something significant in their life, in the life of the Israelite people, so often they, they built an altar or they stopped and worshipped. It was a common practice. They, they wanted to give thanks to God. Or when they were confused, they turned to worship. Or when they were scared, they turned to worship. Or when they were... We see it over and over and over again in the words of Scripture. Reading the Bible, I mean, the way to deal with loneliness, with anger, with bitterness, with alcoholism, the way to deal with being spiritually stuck. What else can spending time in his word transform? I mean, the list just keeps on going on. There's one that, that is taking over America as, as the internet has made it so accessible. And as we look at all of our different screens, as you look at in movies and you look in television shows, even on standard TV today, the stuff that is being poured forth between the language and the filth and the images of, of relationships that... This study said that there was a drop of 61% in use of pornography. It's an epidemic levels in our nation right now. Will we allow God to transform us? To teach us how to wear the new self? To live in the new self? To let go of that old thing that it's so familiar and that it's so easy to step back into, to so, so easy to get drawn back in by. We want a life that pleases God. And we want a life in which we are thriving. When we walk each day and, and we, we have that sense of of living in the blessing, living in the presence, living in the power of God. But it's not going to happen by saying, okay, God, I did my, my hour of worship, and I prayed a prayer for the magic thing to happen. It takes us aligning our lives and saying, God, I, I need to be fed by you. And some will argue and they say, but this word doesn't change. But you do. And I do. And the influence the world exerts on us every day challenges us to compromise, to waver, and to rationalize. 
was talking with a brother just the other day and said, you know, it's like, uh -uh, you know, it's time to give up my addiction. That's it. And then decided, you know, I can probably do this once a month and it'll, it won't affect me. I'll still be in control. That's where we start, isn't it? That's where we start with our wavering. And then we say, well, look, I'm in control. I'm only doing it once a month. I can do it twice a month. Once a week? Twice a week? At what point have you lost control? At what point of rationalizing have we lost control in those things? Those are all elements in which God is saying, keep on holding to my word, keep on learning from my Lord, keep on drawing from it, because the world is trying to teach you that you can compromise, and it's the same thing. But it's not, is it? If we want to find the life that is in him, then we can't make up our own solution. Our own solution that's like, okay, well, great, we got, we got 57% of God, 43% of our way, that should be good enough. Or maybe we'll go 80-20. When we try to leave ourselves in it. What is it in your life right now? Where is the place where you hunger the most to grow and discover what God has for you? Where is it in your life that you desire transformation? What relationships do you desire it in? The question is, how are you approaching it? Are you wishing it would change? Are you just hoping it'll change because... You do a few religious things? Or are you investing in letting him teach you and lead you? I want to take you to the psalmist David. He's King David. I mean, he's called the man after God's own heart. And we're, we're going to read some phrases here that they don't say, you know, David loved the Bible because there wasn't a Bible at this point. There were a bunch of scrolls. Most of them had a lot of laws. Listen to how David talks about this. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and innocent of transgre great transgressions. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. I mean, David, the man after God's own heart, and he's saying, you know what? I spend my day focusing on the Lord's precepts, the Lord's laws, the Lord's guidance, the Lord, because that's where I find my strength, my anchoring. My, he keeps my eyes and my life oriented on what is right and good and true. And he confesses, he says, I know I can't do it on my own. I know I need this. I know I need you to guide me every day and that your word is, is a vision that needs to always be before my eyes. David figured it out. And he's one who should have had it all together, right? I mean, a man after God's own heart. And even in figuring it out, we know the story of, of David and Bathsheba. and we find That old life clawing into him and saying, come back this way. You may know the Lord God, the faithful God of Israel, but come over here and take control and do things your way, David. That old life clawed at him, the man after God's own heart, and it got a hold of his heart. He bought into those lies. Why? One of the things we know about David's sin is that it said, David wasn't where he belonged. He was supposed to be off, the war, off to war, but instead he was hanging out in the palace and walking around in places he shouldn't have been walking around. I gotta wonder what other parts of his life 
had strayed in that way. If you had turned away and you weren't doing what you were supposed to be doing in those areas, might you have turned away from the scrolls, from the laws, from the precepts of the Lord? Might you have laid those down and said, hey, you know, I got this. Might the man after God's own heart have gotten to the point where he says, I know enough, I've reviewed these enough, I've got them down solidly. I don't need to spend time in them, to dwell on them, to, to meditate on them day and night. Is it David got so full of himself of thinking that I got it, that that's what drew him back into the old way? And aren't we just as susceptible? Don't we have the same struggle? And yet we have something that David didn't have. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit inside of us, guiding us, warning us, correcting our path, and turning us back toward the Lord our God trying to squelch pride before it ever shows up and generate humility in us. That we may all become, always come before our God and say, God, in you, in you alone is life. Let me have a hunger and a craving for that life every day. Let me live by the leading of your spirit. Let me live by the power of your word. Let me live by the wonder of your grace poured into me. It's really easy to talk about being led by the Spirit instead of being led by the flesh. But it takes discipline. It takes us immersing in the practices that have been lifted up by thousands who have come before us, who have said, spend time in God's Word. Let His laws, His precepts, His teaching be on your heart. Review them often. Dwell in them and find strength in them. As you come up against the world, as it presses in, remember how our Lord defended when the world pressed in on him. When Satan himself pressed in. He went back and he quoted what? God's word. That's it. To be anchored and know who we are and whose we are. Gracious Lord and God, we love you. And Satan would have us forget that we belong to you. He would have us forget that you're our strength. He would have us forget that by the blood you shed for us, Lord, you didn't just free us. You tore open the curtain and restored a relationship in which we live in the power of your love and grace every day. Satan's lies have no place in our life. We confess that we forget that sometimes. We forget it, Lord, because we we aren't spending enough time in your truth and your promise that you wrote to us. Lord, we are hungry to be in your word. Hungry to hold one another accountable. That we may dwell with you and find strength. We love you, Lord. Amen.
changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Holy words are they for all time in this church. Into us through sacrifice. Holy word. 